people love the Devil May Cry series for two reasons. Reason one. And reason two is that Devil May Cry may have the best combat in all of action game history. To many, Devil May Cry looks like every other action game. A button mash simulator, just with a darker coat of paint this time. And that's okay, I mean, button mashes can be fun. However, to the dedicated few, the DMC series far surpasses almost every other action game out there. If Dante's style wasn't enough to do it, if the creative weaponry wasn't enough to do it, and if the series' unashamedly goofy charm wasn't enough to do it, Devil May Cry maintains a passionate and dedicated fanbase, largely because of its combat. And what makes DMC's combat so special is that it holds a tremendous amount of depth. Thanks to one small change that had an enormous impact. Follow enough fighting game players on Twitter, and it won't be long before you're inundated with threads about depth in fighting games. Which fighting games have depth? Which ones don't? What's player expression? Do motion inputs create depth? Depth, 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 it's all we talk about. But to be honest, it makes sense that it's such a big talking point within the fighting game community. Most people still view fighting games as button mashes. My co-worker, who is a big gamer herself, recently told me she was surprised I play them since, well, they're all the same. Which is something I'm sure most of us have heard a lot throughout the years. But if you've landed on this video, you probably know that isn't quite true. These games hold a tremendous amount of depth, which is exactly why we're still here and still having fun. We keep having all these discussions around depth because it's interesting to talk about all the different, intricate ways that modern day fighting games strive to capture it. When you start to notice how small changes can have big impacts, like suddenly being able to drift during a Roman cancel and envisioning all the changes that could bring, you develop this newfound appreciation for fighting games. But of course, you were able to glean all of that from a minor change. You play way too many fighting games. A casual player is not going to notice that. Instead, they'll be like Bob, a good friend of mine. You know, I still remember when Bob vehemently stood by the opinion that Naruto to Bit Ninja Storm is deeper than Street Fighter because it's 3D instead of 2D. Yes, that was his only reasoning. Of course, he barely played traditional fighting games, but anyone that's played a good amount of both traditional fighters and arena fighters can understand the stark difference between the two. Now yes, I am throwing a bit of shade at Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm here, but admittedly, the series has attempted to capture the same depth that you can find in many traditional fighting games. Don't believe me? Here's the director himself, Hiroshi Matsuyama, talking about how he wanted Storm to have the same depth that you can find in many traditional fighters. え、まあ、あの、ま、対戦の駆け引きをコードにね、楽しんでいただくために、サイバーコネクト2のガイブから、え、ま、あの、いわゆる対戦格闘ゲームにま、提出した方っていうのをね、お招きしまして、え、ま
Revolution's attempt at achieving depth and increasing longevity misses the mark because, well, you pissed us off by taking our tools away, and nothing about this new mechanic has the potential to evolve alongside the player. Whether a player has Revolution for 2 hours or for 200, the gameplay is not going to look any different just because of team types. I don't see team types as real depth. I see a surface level attempt to introduce choice to the player, and preferably, I don't want my decision making around a system mechanic to happen before the actual fighting game fight has begun. Ultimately, my opinion was that asking players to choose a particular mode before a match felt like an artificial form of depth, and I came away from that experience with a new appreciation for traditional fighters and the effort they put into creating real, meaningful depth within the match. Then DNF Jewel rose from the ashes and said, Hey guys, we're adding a new system mechanic where you can choose which cube type you want to use before the match starts. I did not even look at the descriptions of what each cube does and how they change the gameplay. I just immediately saw red flags and associated it with my opinion on Storm Revolution. This is not how you bring depth to a fighting game. But then a few seconds passed and I realised I was completely wrong. Exist between dream and reality. Mark and match oh, shape. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to be using the term pre-select quite a lot throughout this video, so let me explain what I mean when I say pre-select. Not every fighting game does it, but there is a trope in fighting games where you're asked to select an option before the match. It could be a massively important decision like asking you to select a groove or to select a moon type. Or it could be something a bit smaller, like asking you to select a, a gem type. The size and the impact doesn't matter. When I say pre-select, it's just my easiest way of describing the phenomenon in fighting games where you need to select an option before the fight actually starts. I tried to avoid coming up with a new term, but I just kept confusing myself, and I'd probably confuse you guys too. So, I I'm going with pre-select, okay? Anyway. I had completely forgotten that several traditional fighters do incorporate pre-select into their games. Some of the most popular fighting games have it, and Capcom especially seems quite fond of the idea. The thing is, nobody seems to be bothered by it. Like, I don't ever see it discussed, at least not in a way where people are talking about the whole concept of selecting options before the match begins. And whenever I do see people talk about it, it's in a positive light. In Nathan Darmy's article titled Player Expression in Fighting Games, he says, Grooves, ratios, and custom characters allow players who like a certain set of tools, but not the rest, to tweak them around to their liking. This can make mirror matches even further distinct from each other, since very few people will be playing certain mechanics with the same groove, or critical art, or v-skill, etc. Offering universal engine mechanics that completely change how the game is played is another way that developers can foster player expression. And what he's saying makes sense. On paper. However, I'm cautious about whether pre-select really is the additional depth or access to player expression that these games try to sell you on. It sounds good when they're telling you about all these different ways you can play. You can select the Power Stone, or you could select the Reality Stone, or you could select the Space Stone. It's all up to you. That's expression, right? Of course it sounds good, but have you ever envisioned what some of these games might look like if they didn't feature a pre-select at all? With Storm Revolution, which was not well received by its players, it was easy to be upset by the different team types because players had already experienced this series without pre-select for years prior. But would Storm players still hate Revolution if the series was like that from the start? 
It's easy to look at Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite and think that being forced to pick one Infinity Stone at the beginning of the match is the only way that the game could work. But what would Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite look like if you could use the upgrades of any stone during a match? And speaking of tag team fighters, they have a reputation for asking players to select one of three different assist moves for each character before the match begins. At this point, it just feels like a staple element of tag team fighters. Yet, in recent years, tag games like Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle have come out and let you run all three assists during the match rather than forcing you to choose and stick to only one before the match begins. So what I'm asking is, what does pre-select actually do for a fighting game? Is it good? Is it bad? Or is it maybe both? And what does it mean for player expression? To answer some of these questions, we definitely have to look at the most popular fighting game series of all time, Street Fighter, which seems obsessed with having some kind of pre-select in their games. Street Fighter 3 forces you to select a critical art before the match, and Street Fighter 4 does basically the same thing by asking you to select your ultra combo. These are all just selecting your super moves, by the way, just with fancy names. Street Fighter Alpha 3 asks you to select between three different isms, which can affect a whole table's worth of mechanics. The big one is that A-ism and X-ism have super moves, but V-ism takes out supers entirely and gives you a custom combo power-up instead. But I actually want to focus on Street Fighter 5 and their form of pre-select, the V system. It's simple. Everyone has a V skill, which is literally just another special move, and a V trigger, which is a very strong ability, often a buff or a particularly strong attack that you can use once the V gauge is full. I will say, Street Fighter V didn't launch with pre-select. Originally, characters had only one V skill and one V trigger, but through Street Fighter V's many updates, Capcom really leaned into the whole V gimmick and introduced new moves through V Skill 2 and V Trigger 2. But of course, you don't always have access to these new moves. Before the match begins, you have to decide which V Skill and which V Trigger you want to use. So let's look at Dalsim. V Skill 1 offers Yoga Float, which is a great, useful tool, but there's also the option of V Skill 2, Yoga Deep Breath which makes Dalsim's flames bounce off of the ground. You can only choose one, so what kind of Dalsim are you? Do you like to float above projectiles, or do you like having some extra bounce in your flames? Well, I mean, you probably like both, but this is Street Fighter V, so you can only choose one. The PR was that having different V-Skills and V-Triggers to choose from added more options and depth to the combat system. And this isn't a lie? But I think this wording is incredibly deceiving, and to explain why, we've got to take a step back from all of these questions about depth and player expression. What we really need to answer is, why are we playing fighting games at all? The answer isn't complicated. Beating people up with cool characters is fun. That's really the core of it, the heart of the genre. When I picked up Jamie in Street Fighter VI, I wasn't thinking very hard about the drinking mechanic and any depth to it. I picked him up because this dude breakdances on people, and I think that's cool. He also says, hold this L when you perfect parry. And you know, I confess, this one got me. However, what does keep me interested in this character after dozens of hours is all that other stuff that I pick up along the way. Even in the internet era where we're constantly sharing all this tech we found and can develop our characters at record speeds, when we're actually inside a match, there's still a whole mountain of nuance to our play and so much room for personal growth. It didn't take me long to figure Jamie out, because the game plan isn't complicated. I have my pressure tools, my neutral tools, sometimes I'll chase for Oki, sometimes I opt to take a drink, maybe because I'm trying to scam them later with command grab, it all depends, but it's not complicated. All I really need to do is focus on cleaning up my fundamentals and developing my decision making. That journey of improvement itself could keep me invested for hundreds of hours, but I want to quickly share this revolutionary, game-changing moment that happened to me not too long ago. Right, are you ready? <clears throat> I made a misinput. 
yeah, that, that's it. I um, I wanted to press heavy punch, but I was holding backwards for a tad bit too long. And uh, what I got was back heavy punch, a move that I like to pretend didn't exist. Now, although miss inputs usually have me cursing, I was pleasantly surprised when I saw that it worked out for me in a way that I didn't expect. My reaction was kind of like, whoa, what was that? That was pretty cool. And I didn't immediately rush into training mode or anything, I just started throwing it out at certain places to see what would happen. The results varied, but I saw some promising stuff. And now, thanks to a random misinput, I feel like there's a whole new course of options I can explore. On offense, on defense, and if I drank as much as Jamie did, maybe I'd start using it in neutral as well. So, here's the thing. What I just described to you is an example of finding a fighting game, seeing a character that piques your interest, then discovering the depth that keeps you invested. Notice though that all the cool stuff about Jamie and the depth waiting to be discovered are all things that take place within a match, an actual fight. Where it did not happen is at the character select screen, where you'll discover my first issue with pre-select in fighting games. Capcom did not lie. The existence of different V-Skills and V-Triggers, in a literal sense, are more options for you to pick from, but do any of us play fighting games to make good choices on the character select screen? Well, I guess Happy Chaos players are happy about making the right choice of character select, but you get what I mean. The V-System of Street Fighter V fails to bring new, meaningful depth to the game because, regardless of which V-Skill or V-Trigger you select before the match, the actual gameplay remains relatively linear. If you want to use any of the new options introduced through V-Skill and V-Trigger, you're forced to sacrifice the old option. In the same article I quoted earlier, Nathan Darmy also wrote, The more tools a character has, the wider the possibility space suddenly becomes for their player, who can thus create very specific game plans to their liking by constructing it around certain options. I'm with Nathan on this one, and this quote really cuts to the core of my problems with pre-select. Pre-select, by its very existence, is about sacrificing options. When we have less options, we have less possibility, and we're less able to stand out from our fellow players. So yes, it feels deceptive to see implementations of pre-select options promoted as an opportunity to be creative, stand out as a player, be an individual, or introduce further depth. Pre-select is really about giving the appearance of depth while only taking it away. And sure, there can be some expression or depth involved in the decision of what V-Skill or what V-Trigger you'll go with, but it's about as deep as tic-tac-toe. Once you figure out that filling the corners is how you secure victory, tic-tac-toe is suddenly not so riveting anymore. In Street Fighter V, once you figure out which V-Skill and V-Trigger works best for your character, your playstyle, and certain matchups, the V-System doesn't feel so deep or personal anymore. And for the record, if Street Fighter V is the tic-tac-toe of fighting games, then Street Fighter VI is definitely bop it. Fight. I think the best example of pre-select standing in the way of depth can be found in a totally different Capcom game. Except, it's not a fighting game at all. Yeah, I'm a Devil May Cry fan, but what can I say? The characters are cool, the third game had a nice story, and the series is cheesy in a really fun way. I'm not as connected to the series as many other DMC fans that I know, but I have put hundreds of hours into the game solely because the combat is mind-blowingly great. There's a decent amount of crossover between DMC and fighting game fans. Hell, there's even a DMC mod out there called Devil May Cry Strive that adds Roman cancels to the game. That is bullshit. I haven't given it deep thought or anything, but I've always suspected that DMC appeals to fighting game players because both games present similar challenges to the player and create similar feelings of accomplishment. 
An easy example is the great feeling you get from finally executing a tough combo that you've been practicing. The combo fiends who love high execution fighting games would have a blast with Devil May Cry, maybe. But combo execution isn't the only similarity these games have. In fact, combo execution is the one I care the least about. I'm more interested in character mastery, refining your gameplay with better, intentional movement, playing cleanly enough to not whiff buttons, Virgil will actually punish you for whiffing a button by the way, demonstrating consistency with mechanics that involve strict timings. I basically don't want to look like I'm flailing about. The point is, mastering a character in Devil May Cry largely involves the same set of skills used when mastering a character in a fighting game. Granted, not every Devil May Cry character is built equally. Some may take a few dozen hours to feel proficient with, while others may take hundreds. Nero's gameplay has historically been criticised for not offering nearly as much depth as Dante's, who he shared his debut game with. Nero has advanced tech, but it's easy to hit a wall when you're learning him. Trish and Lady have also faced similar criticisms. Meanwhile, Virgil is a well-designed character capable of satisfying players at every level. There's a lot in his kit that you can experiment with, but with enough hours, even he is prone to feeling like there's nothing new you can learn. I'm going to pretend V doesn't exist. Dante himself is Devil May Cry's masterpiece, their poster boy for depth and expression, though he's very tricky to handle which puts off a lot of newcomers. It takes a lot of hours and a lot of dedication, but once players are past that first hurdle, Dante feels powerful and you'll at least be able to clear missions consistently. But anyone that has put time into Dante will know, even when you've practiced and practiced and feel awesome after doing something really cool, you know that you are still so, so, so far away from what DMC players are doing with Dante at the top level. But that's nothing to be sad about because that's the exact appeal of modern Dante. This character is flooded with tools, you're never going to struggle to find something new, and there's always an opportunity to elevate your gameplay. He really is a marvel to learn. However, the depth that you can find to this version of Dante was only made possible by removing Devil May Cry's pre-select. Modern Dante originated with Devil May Cry 3, the first DMC to have, well, anime combos. What really dates this version of Dante is that he's restricted by a form of pre-select. At the start of each mission, the player must select a style that they want to play under, the main four being Trickster, Swordmaster, Royal Guard, and Gunslinger. Trickster is a mobility-focused style. Dante gains a ground dash, an air dash, and a teleport, to name a few. Swordmaster is a combo-focused style. For example, Dante will get extra aerial attacks. Uh, this basic combo with Rebellion doesn't actually exist out of Swordmaster. Without this style, the only move he can use with Rebellion in the air is Helmbreaker. Royal Guard is a parry-focused style. Parry, absorb power, fire it back tenfold. Gunslinger is a... maybe it's a range-focused style? It's all about his guns and other projectiles, and they have neat tricks, but this is the least popular style for a reason. Back in 2005, this was the first time we'd seen any gameplay like Dante's, but needless to say, it was very well received. These reviews from almost two decades ago echo the same sounds you hear from some fighting games today. These different options are lending depth to the gameplay. But what makes DMC3 such an interesting case is that, I think it's safe to say, the fan favourite version of the game is one where pre-select doesn't exist. Many DMC3 players on PC use a mod called Style Switcher, which allows Dante to freely switch between different styles, as much as he wants, in real time during missions. A mod that copies how Dante's styles work in Devil May Cry 4, but as it goes, due to being unable to mod their game, console fans of Devil May Cry 3 couldn't play this version of Dante. Unless you were on Nintendo Switch, that is. When DMC3 got yet another re-release, this time for the Switch, the developers surprised fans with a new gameplay feature called Freestyle Mode, their new name for what is essentially an official version of the Style Switcher mod. This version is regarded by many as the definitive edition of Devil May Cry 3 Special Edition, one where Capcom went back to pluck pre-select from their game. 
Original Dante was fun, but I think freestyling Dante is on a completely different level. It just is more fun to have more tools, to use my own preferences to decide which tool is best for me in that moment. It should be that simple, but it isn't. Freestyling Dante feels amazing, but DMC3 was not built without the need to select a style in mind. These levels and these enemies were designed to be defeated with a Dante that wielded dramatically less tools. Meanwhile, freestyle mode is essentially Dante bringing 10 guns to a knife fight. Some criticise this official implementation of style switching by saying Dante is too powerful, that he breaks the balance of the game. I'd imagine that these players take issue with the fact that players can now say they beat Devil May Cry 3 and got all these ranks in a setting that is far less challenging. Hey, that's a valid criticism. Did pre-select hold value to DMC3 as a means of balancing? Well, I personally love freestyle mode. It turns DMC3's Dante into the version that we have in 4 and 5, the Dante with a colossal level of depth that offers challenge and expression, just by taking out the pre-select. Funnily enough, I think it's a great example of how fighting games with pre-select only work to lessen the depth of their characters, contrary to the message that they often promote. Mind you, people's critiques of freestyling mode don't ever say that Dante isn't more fun. They think he's broken, and that's probably where our differences lie. I care really, really little about video game achievements or in-game rankings, but those things mean a lot more to other players. Having this overpowered Dante that isn't restricted by a pre-select does diminish the original challenge of DMC3, something that the game had a reputation for. But like I said, I don't really care that losing pre-select may break the balance. I'm here to do combos on demons that really suck at attacking me. That is all. But things would get much more complicated if I weren't fighting demons, and instead, I was fighting another player. Despite my concerns about pre-select existing in fighting games, it may have a purpose as a necessary evil, something to keep the balance in check. Earlier, I fantasised about a Marvel vs Capcom Infinite where you could use any Infinity Stone power-up of your choosing during the match. While that scenario is interesting to think about, you could very quickly imagine how obnoxious that would be to deal with. The Infinity Stone power-ups of Marvel vs Capcom Infinite are already incredibly strong, and that's in a situation where you're locked into only one type of stone before the match begins. The Soul Stone can revive a dead character, the Space Stone will literally trap your opponent in a box, the Reality Stone covers the whole screen with a bunch of projectiles, and that's just three of the six Infinity Stones. I don't want to fight someone who can choose which stone they want to abuse on the fly. Even if both players could do this, I would still see it as poor balancing because balancing isn't always about making the match fair. A lot of the time, it's about making sure that the game isn't incredibly obnoxious to play. Without that balance, you'd end up like Dragon Ball Fighters. If pre-select was an effective way of keeping Dante balanced, the same could be said for fighting games. Tag fighters are notoriously more unhinged than 1v1 fighters, but even they use pre-select to keep things in check. I wouldn't want to play a Marvel 3 where Doctor Doom has hidden missiles and a beam assist, but Marvel 3 scares me, so Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle is particularly interesting because it breaks the mold that tag fighters have stuck to for so many years. Everyone has free assists, but you aren't forced to make a choice on which one you want to bring into the match. You're free to use whichever of the free assists feels appropriate at any point, and I think this plays a large role in why BB Tag is so goddamn unhinged. With the game's current mechanics, it would be a bonkers game regardless, but the freedom on assists really takes some characters and setups to the next level. For example, Mitsuru. She's been cruising at the top of the tier list ever since her debut, and she is a solid character, period. Great buttons to guide her through neutral, and a very easy instant overhead that spells constant high-low 50-50s for her opponent. That's great, but even more annoying, she has two fantastic assists. Her neutral assist is Kudra, or however the French say it, an insanely fast lunging ground special that will snipe opponents. Then, 
Her forward assist is Myriad Arrows, a set of projectile ice shards with annoyingly good tracking. Good to have as a projectile itself, but if you know BB Tag, it's also perfect for ridiculous cross up setups. Sandwich them together, and then it's almost, it's just unreactable left right mix ups, right? Back when I still paid attention to BB Tag, Yuzuriha and Mitsuru made a top tier pair with nasty neutral, nasty mix, and complete control over the pace of the match. US Twitter, English Twitter, always talking about, you know, use a Mitsu, use a Mitsu, use a Mitsu, best team in the game, hands down. I genuinely did not enjoy viewing this. In the beginning, it was funny, but then I got tired of seeing the same thing over and over. But that's just the story of BB Tag. It's an obnoxious game that grants you a lot of freedoms. I wouldn't be super quick to recommend BB Tag to a fighting game player that is faint of heart. And when developers make decisions like adding a pre-select, this obnoxious gameplay and my aversion to recommending a game like BB Tag to newcomers, maybe that's exactly what they're trying to avoid. I wonder, maybe if BB Tag actually did use some kind of pre-select, the team of Yuzuriha and Mitsuru could have been less obnoxious? They are them, so it would be dumb anyway, but it would definitely be more fightable. I know they're no longer the top dogs now that Arxis added even more obnoxious assists to the game, but I don't really keep up anymore. It stands to reason then, that even through my dislike of how pre-select can be a limiting factor when it comes to depth, it very well may be important in the way of making the overall game more enjoyable. Street Fighter V's pre-select seems strict and unreasonable, but Street Fighter V always had a specific vision of being a very linear and streamlined fighting game. Even though they gave everyone new moves, adding it onto the existing move list without any sacrifice wasn't an option because that wouldn't be Street Fighter V. That would be Street Fighter VI, where Dalsim can actually use Yoga Flow and have Bouncing Flames in the same match. Street Fighter VI's design philosophies feel like the polar opposite of what Capcom intended with Street Fighter V. No limits. This time, you start your match with a full gauge. Under classic controls, characters have access to every move in their arsenal all at once. No streamlining. There's a lot more variance in frame data and pressure, as opposed to using very similar frame data and pressure structures throughout the cast. It's just a different game, but I think it's important to note that it's a game that the majority seems to prefer. Many people's issues with Street Fighter V can't be boiled down to merely pre-select, but I do think that it plays a big role, or at least, the design philosophies of Street Fighter V that lead to pre-select are philosophies that fighting game players aren't super fond of. We fighting game players love having options, and pre-select still stands as the antithesis to that. It's a balancing act. I may not immediately like pre-select, but if its presence makes the fighting game I'm about to play balanced and enjoyable, instead of an overpowered mess, I'll gladly take it. There's just no way I could dismiss all forms of pre-select as bad. It's always going to be a case-by-case -case basis and a balancing act. Capcom vs SNK2 and its famous groove system is not a form of pre-select that I would ever call bad. For one, I don't think I've played anywhere near enough of that game to be criticising it, but also, once you look at all the options it's giving you, there is no realistic way that you could fit this into one moveset. It needs to be split into different grooves, and in this case, I don't think that different grooves are fake depth. Different grooves change so many mechanics, both to the system and to the character that you're playing, that the gameplay on one character alone will feel drastically different between grooves. We're talking being able to run versus suddenly having a step dash. That's how different they get. When the differences between what you select are this big, I don't feel like I'm being conned out of an option or two, like an assist or a special move or a super. With grooves, I really do feel like I've stepped into a different character. And this is where I would believe developers if they sold this game to me saying that grooves add so much depth to the system. I really think it does. The Moons of Melty Blood are a similar situation. You're made to select either Crescent, Half or Full Moon before the match begins, but the moons you select not only change how your meter works, but it will greatly affect how your pressure strings work, completely swap out whole sets of special moves, it might even give you a brand new dash. Once again, they feel like completely different characters, and in these cases, I really do think that pre-select is a good addition. In the older Melty Blood, the third version of Akiha, now in a school uniform, 
who multiplayers call Seifuku to avoid confusion, has three different moons that I like every one of. But there is a ranking to which versions of Seifuku I prefer. My favourite is Full Moon Seifuku, because I like how her normals look, and how this ring looks, but I don't like Full Moon's mechanics because this moon disables reverse beat. Then my second favourite version was Half Moon Seifuku, because I enjoy how her combos look, but I despise Half Moon's mechanics because it forces you to spend your meter the moment it becomes full, and I, 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 I just don't like it. Then there's Crescent Seifuku. When I was getting into the game, my friends were all like, No, no, don't pick Full Moon Seifuku, pick Crescent Seifuku, one of the stronger characters in the game. But <sighs> Crescent Seifuku is actually my least favourite version, which is annoying because Crescent Moon is actually packaged with my favourite of the system mechanics. Pre-select does you like that sometimes, I suppose? I did not stick with Seifuku. The real problem I had navigating Melty was that all the characters I took an interest in happened to be low tier, and in a game that essentially triples the size of the character select screen once different versions are added into the mix, it was hard to find high level footage of the characters I actually liked. The character I enjoyed the most was Vampire Shion on Crescent Moon, but nobody played her, except Squat in tournament maybe one time. She apparently sucked, and everyone played the Half Moon version of Vampire Shion. Why wouldn't they? She was the optimal choice. This is my final issue with pre-select in fighting games. This entire thing has been about choice and making decisions, selecting something that suits you best. Even when pre-select stands in the way of depth, even when the choice is about as deep as tic-tac-toe, it's still a choice you get to make, right? That's right, it is a choice you get to make. But most of the time, there's a right choice and a wrong choice. Actually, I don't think that wording is accurate. Most of the time, there's a good choice and a bad choice. The differing options presented to you at Character Select are supposed to be balanced enough that the deciding factor isn't the option themselves, rather, it's what you, as a player, prefer. Unfortunately, most of the time, one option ends up standing above the rest, so much so that you'd be handicapping yourself for not picking it. Remember Ibuki's V-Trigger 1, the bombs? Those were fun to see, but I never saw it again after Capcom gave her the shuriken for V-Trigger 2, which, judging by every Ibuki I have ever seen, yeah, I think shuriken is the objectively better pick. But if you know me well, you know that I'm not fond of the idea that the optimal choice negates every other choice. Recently more than ever, the FGC seems to discuss everything from the perspective of top level play. You have to do this combo, and this setup, and this move is useless because a top 8 player would beat it every time. Now, you don't have to be a top level player to think like one. If you're trying to pursue a very high level in whatever game you're playing, you probably should make strictly optimal decisions. But I don't buy that all of us are ultra competitive. I do care about winning and improving, I even care about placing well at the tournaments that I paid money to enter, but fighting games are about having fun first, at least for me. I already made a video explaining that I'm just trying to enjoy myself when I play these games, and based on the comments, I know I'm not the only one. I can only speak for myself, but I don't care that much about making the optimal decision. I play the regular version of Junpei over the better Shadow version, because I think Shadow Junpei has cringy voice lines and a cringy face. The point is, the optimal choice doesn't really matter when you're just trying to have fun. You still get to decide on the right choice for you. Where the optimal choice does still matter, even to those just playing for fun, is in spectatorship. Yes, watching fighting games, the other part of being in the FGC. Tournaments are amazing because I love seeing what pure expertise can look like, but I also think that pre-select can have unfortunate consequences on even the spectator experience as well. During play, the impact of the optimal choice is felt most strongly at top level. A very, very small percentage of players sit within that range, but that small percentage is being watched by the rest of the community. Even if the existence of an optimal choice doesn't affect your gameplay, it definitely affects the tournaments that you watch. 
If character diversity can improve the spectator experience, then so can good representation of your game's pre-select options. But we just don't have that because balancing is tough and one option usually comes out on top. You'll see the same super, the same ultra, the same V-trigger, V-skill, ism, shadow version, assist, team types, you name it. So, although pre-select is meant to offer depth and expression, you tend to witness the opposite at top level. Much like how Dante became more interesting to spectate after Style Switch was introduced, I do believe that many fighting games could have been an even better spectator experience if they weren't packaged with pre-select. But hey, without the pre-select, I guess that would just break the balance, right? So if you made it all the way to the end of this video, thank you so much. Like, a massive, massive thank you. It's been a while since I've written a video, and I really didn't want this video to be too long. And honestly, I omitted things because I was like, I want to keep this video short. I don't want it to be too long. I'm a busy guy now. And I'm recording this, and I'm thinking, why the hell is this so long? But I just had to cover every base, like every thought that was in my mind. And if you really did make it this far, thank you so, so much for sticking with it and listening to me. I truly appreciate it. I put a lot of effort into this script and I hope you enjoyed this video.